Hey everybody, we are back with episode three of that podcast. I am Ryan Janke and we're here with Pastor DJ Lura and Sarah DeYoung. How's it going? Good. Good. Living the dream. Living the dream every day, absolutely. So how was how was everybody's Easter? Easter was fantastic. Uh, for me, it was really cool because it's been a long time, like decades, uh, where I've gotten to, to be in worship with my family rather than in the role of pastor. So I got to be dad. Yeah. Uh, you know, we, with, uh, you know, our senior pastor, Paul Cross, doing a phenomenal job leading worship on Sunday and preaching. I got to be at home with my kids and, um, and experience worship on the other side of the screen during this, this, you know, with our online worship. And, and it was really cool. Um, we did communion and my girls, uh, uh, who are both um, middle school, high school age, mm -hmm. uh, got up and my younger daughter got the bread and broke it into four pieces. And my uh, older daughter got the little uh, sippy cups that we had for, for wine. And um, uh, when, when Pastor consecrated the elements through the words of institution and then commissioned those to distribute who have the elements, he made preachers out of my kids. And my daughter came over and was like, the body of Christ given for you, the blood of Christ shed for you. And it was, it was really cool. And then all of us who were of communion age, uh, my daughters, my wife and me, we all uh, laid hands on our on our young son and blessed him after the fact, and so it was, it was very, um, very meaningful to me. I really enjoyed it. Yeah, that's cool. Very blessed. I bet it's been a while too since, um, even if you were actually at whatever church you were serving at, it's probably been a long time since you even just sat back and, and enjoyed the the worship as you know, not up on in front of everybody preaching or, or doing anything. Well, yeah, it's, it's uh, even pastors are worshiping, but there's the added responsibility of their office in leading orderly worship. And to be able to be in that state of rest and um, obedience to the word of God and to just receive it, to just, you know, yeah. be there like everyone else, just, just uh, believers, who are, are coming uh, in repentance to receive the Word of God is, is something that's very special Yeah, and, and is needed. Right, yeah, yeah, for sure. How about you, Sarah? Good. Um, it was really cool to see. I had a lot of friends. I think last week you had said, DJ, about all you need is a crumb of bread and something to drink. Mm -hmm. So I got a lot of Snapchats from my friends that morning. It's like, we didn't know communion was happening because I prefer we to be like, hey, write a book. You can watch church with us here. <laughs> So finally, it, like, so I was getting pictures of my friends with, with waffles and whatever, <laughs> like bread and <laughs> drink that they had. They're like, this will work. But they all loved it, so that was really cool to see. And I have a friend who is, her and her fiance live and separately from her sister and her husband live separately, and then her parents live separately. And they all got a chance to worship together, which is really cool. Yeah. So just kind of seeing that family connection that everybody still got to have. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Physically being together, too. Mm -hmm. Right. It, it was neat for me because I was here um, at the church uh, helping with the broadcast. Um, we did, we recorded a few things that morning, um, but then, you know, we had our live pieces and we had pieces that had been recorded, you know, a week before or whatever. And it was neat for me because there were only, well, there were four of us here in the building at one point, um, but then uh, uh, he left and then it was just the three of us just Pastor Cross uh, leading, and then I was running uh, cameras, and um, Mark was in the back with all the broadcast stuff. And what was neat for me was taking communion mm -hmm. with just the three of us. Mm -hmm. I remember earlier this winter when we had service, but it was snowy outside, not a lot, not a lot of people came, and Pastor Cross invited everybody up to the front um, and he, he distributed yeah. to each person individually the bread and the wine. And I thought, wow, this is a really neat experience. 
and this was even, you know, that this was different from that because it was just us three, mm -hmm. you know, taking communion together. So that was neat. That's something that I won't forget for, for a pretty long time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, that that was neat. And so that that uh, brings up just worship in general. You well, I would add, you know, I'm just wondering if the Easter Bunny came to anyone's house uh, mm -hmm. over Easter. Uh, our Easter Bunny brought peeps, so uh, obviously did not listen to uh, uh, the podcast about... Um, <laughs> I got a lot of... I got two... I want to say... Well, I would classify one as hate mail because it was a little bit... But, um, <laughs> we, 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 did, we did get some hate mail. Um, Avis and Erica love peeps, and both of them said that <laughs> well, I th I think Avis is brilliant, and I told her so after the fact. You know, you brought up the Easter Bunny. Um, there was uh, somebody who's on staff here was at home, and after the service, another uh, member of our congregation went over to their house, rang the doorbell, and then st stood back on the sidewalk, and. Uh, when they came to the door, the person outside yelled to them and said, did you hear? He is risen. The tomb is empty. The tomb is empty. And took off like a mad woman. And <laughs> sounds like that was pretty neat. <laughs> so I didn't do any of that. They weren't wearing a bunny costume, though? I, that I don't know. Oh, okay. No, right. that wasn't mentioned. It was, it was focusing on what Easter is really about, which <laughs> is Christ is risen. He yeah. is risen indeed, right? He is risen yeah. indeed, yeah. That's cool. Yep, it was, uh, it was uh, an interesting Easter for sure. That could be a new tradition. Uh, 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 not ding dong ditch, but ding dong uh, proclaim or, you know. Ding dong disciple. Ding dong ding, disciple. Ding dong disciple. That's great. I like it. Yeah. Our mission trip is being postponed for the summer. That's something that could be done. Yeah, ding dong disciple uh, later on when we, can, mm -hmm. when we can get out and about. That sounds like a good idea. I might write that down. Ding dong disciple. Um, well, yeah, because you've got a, a ding dong ditch and you've got May Day. They do May Day baskets. Yeah. There's no reason that you couldn't do a ding dong disciple. Yeah. So I think we should look into it. So, um, so worship. We This was a, 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 a way to worship, right? Um, how does this fit into... Um, Earlier we were talking, you talked about public and private worship. So this would be still a form of public worship, correct? In, in w the way that we worshiped on Sunday, even though we were all online or whatever, yeah. th that's a, a form of public worship. Yes, it is. It, it, when, when the assembly of believers gather together in whatever form that takes, you know, uh, nowadays... It seems like it's been much longer than it has, but you know, with uh, what's going on in our world, we are assembling um, online. Mm -hmm. Well, that's the gathering of believers in real time around where Jesus promises to be, his word preached and his sacraments administered for the forgiveness of sinners. And so that is what is known as public worship, the event of worship, the experience of being in God's presence where he promises to be. Now there's a distinction that I think is important to be made between public worship and private worship. And so, you know, when you think about worship, what, what are some of the things that you think of? What are some of the experiences that you've had with worship? So for me, it, it went, you know, it's in phases. When I was a kid, like, I guess I, I have always thought about worship as coming to church and worshiping, singing songs, um, listening, to the, listening to the sermon, that kind of thing. And, you know, when you're a kid, it, it, it consists of uh, sitting underneath the pew or laying on the floor, coloring <laughs> pictures or writing all over the... Eating cheer, right? It, eating cheer, yeah. definitely not peeps. Um, so, you know, when you're a kid and then... Um, as you get older, you're in Sunday school, you need to start paying attention because the, the teacher's gonna ask you questions later probably, and um, then you get older and, and you know you get more engaged and you 
we listen more and, and are able to sort of be in that moment that you weren't when you were younger, kind mm -hmm. of is, is how I is how I have always thought about it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that's really good. I mean, Sarah, do you have any when you think of worship as a kid, what stands out for you? So what I one of my all time favorite ways, like forever I think will be my favorite worship experience, is going to kids camp growing up and like that fireside, like everybody is just there, you're just like singing songs, it's peaceful, relaxing. It's that's probably the many times that I've felt truly like engaged with God one hundred percent there because there's no distractions, there's nothing going on, everybody is on the same page and is just there. Mm -hmm. uh, but I always think about when we brought up that we're going to be talking about the difference between private and public worship is there's been a graphic something, I'm not exactly sure what, going around a lot on social media where it's like, I believe that churches are for worshiping, but so are call rides at 2 a.m. and it mm -hmm. lists down yeah. all these different examples. So that's kind of my question is in that, you know, thing is just there's the difference between public and private. Yeah, yeah, I, and and I think people get it um, instinctively, but it's it's the language that we use that can make things confusing, as always, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so let's talk about private worship, first of all. Private worship is really obedience to God's word. Um, it's it's if you think about the third commandment, God says, "Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy." Uh, there's there's two parts to that, um, the private aspect and the public aspect. Um, Martin Luther says concerning the third the third commandment, he says we are to fear and love God, um, so that we do not deny His word or the preaching of it, but should gladly hear and learn it and live it out in our life. So when you think about what that means, it means obedience, um, which is really when we come before God, worship happens when we recognize that God is your creator and you are God's good creation. It puts you in the right relationship with God. Um, whenever that happens, you are worshiping. Um, now, what is worship? We think of worship often as what we do. Mm -hmm. It's not about what we do. It's about how we respond to what God is doing. So God speaks a word. We're either going to hear it and obey it, or we're going to turn from it. And when you, when you think about that relationship with God, and you are hearing God's word and obeying it, what comes out of you naturally as faith enters your heart is prayer, praise, and thanksgiving, which can happen in a car. It can happen at home with your kids. It can happen in your cubicle at your job. When you begin to recognize and respond in a moment in your day-to-day -day life uh, that God is present with you, uh, blessing you, speaking to you, uh, not in verbal words, as we've, we've said before, but in that kind of epiphany moments, that, that heart language of um, God is with me. The response of the good creation is to pour out in prayer, praise, and thanksgiving. Even if the prayers are nothing more than sighs, but it's sighs that are given in faith. And that's, that's the underlying piece here. It's faith. Where there is faith, you are experiencing worship in that relationship with God. Prayer is communicating with God. Praise is the natural response of recognizing who you are before God and who God is for you mm -hmm. rather than against you. And Thanksgiving is the action. It's, it's, it's you know thanking God for all the goodness that he gives us. That's the proper relationship that the creation has with the creator. The problem is most of the time, because we are sinners, we tune God out and we're busy chasing after whatever distraction is, is around us. But on the simplest form, worship is a personal encounter and relationship with the living God, where he promises to be in his words handed over, his promises handed over. So when you're opening the Bible, you can be worshiping God. When you are praying, if you take a little time each day, you are worshiping God. 
when you're driving in your car, I, I do this often actually, I, I have a bracelet to remind me when I see my bracelet, I say a prayer. Mm -hmm. um, that's worshiping God. It's recognizing that God is with you and the natural response of the crea creation to the creator is worship. So that's individual and it's obedience to God's word. Um, that's true worship. God says, um, uh, you shall not take the Lord's name in vain. Well, when you purposely don't take the Lord's name in vain, that's, that's worship. It's obedience to his word. When you love your neighbor as yourself, that's worship. When you carry out your callings faithfully that God has called you into, your vocation, that is personal worship. And you can grow in your faith. You can grow spiritually by engaging God in private worship. But God does not want us to worship in private alone. Because, again, the third commandment, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy, is God commanding us to gather, to gather with other believers, to be the body of Christ. That's why Jesus says, where two or three are gathered in my name, I am there among them. Why? So that they can experience worship. And in public worship, the rules don't change. It's just it's now happening in a, in a larger group. And what's the primary rule? Obedience. Uh, obedience to God's word. And, and I think we can look at that and be like, well, that sounds like a bad word, like obey. That sounds like something someone's forcing something on you. Yep. No, this is, this is obedience that's spontaneous, and you want to do it rather than having to do it. Um, so what do we bring when we come to worship? I think there's a misunderstanding about what happens in worship that's been floating in uh, American culture, at least for the last 60 years, and it has to do with the word liturgy. You guys know that word? Yeah. What is the liturgy? Any guesses? What, what do you think it is? It's all the smells and bells of... The, the smells and bells. It's, what is it? Paul always says it where it's like, it's the things that we as people have brought in to make it special. To make it special. The, r the rituals that we do. Right. I, I was going to say the order of things that... I think the order of things is the best way to put it, but the way it's been translated is that it's the work of the people. Okay. That's incorrect. That's, that's actually a false reading of what liturgy is, and it has to do with the idea that we're doing something when we come to worship. We need to do something. And so the, the priest or the pastor will, will say something, and the people will respond a certain way. Um, that is a form of liturgy. But that's not what liturgy is. It's, it's, something, it's, it's no more than what you just said. It's the order by which we come together. It's the good order by which we come together to worship together mm -hmm. as a people of God. But we're not doing anything. Rather, God is doing something through the word. And what we are doing is responding to that word through prayer, praise, or thanksgiving. All we bring to church is a repentant heart. That's it. Um, there's nothing that we're doing that is earning God's favor in some way. Like uh, I, one of my favorite um, movies lately, you know, being, being uh, you know, uh, quarantined in the house as we start watching the Pirates of the Caribbean movies again. Yeah. So in the second one, I, I don't know their names, but it's two pirates who were ghosts in the first one. Uh, spoiler alert if anyone hasn't seen this movie. And um, right at the beginning of the movie, they're in a, they're in a rowboat, and they're trying to get to, to Captain Jack Sparrow's boat. And so they're rowing to this beach, and one of them is sitting there with a Bible open. And they'd been ghosts before, and they, one guy, and he says to the one guy, you know, we, we're, not, we're not immortal anymore. We've got to take care of our immortal souls. And he's flipping through, pretending like he's looking at the Bible, and the other guy looks at him and goes, you can't read. <laughs> he goes, it's the Bible. You get points for trying. <laughs> yep. Well, you don't get points for trying because that's not, that's not what worship is. Worship isn't what we do to earn favor from God. Worship happens spontaneously when the Word comes to you right where you are, creating faith in the heart of a sinner to believe that God is not only just and righteous but loving and merciful to a sinner like you mm -hmm. their faith happens by the power of the Holy Spirit that explodes and the response comes out as prayer praise and thanksgiving so when we come to church all we're bringing 
is a repentant heart saying, Lord, forgive me a sinner. Forgive me a sinner. And in worship, the, the, the mode of it, whether it's a, a traditional liturgy that uses all the old Latin phrases like Kyrie eleison and Agnus Dei and you know, all those different pieces, it follows an ordered structure that is there to teach people to receive God faithfully, to receive God's blessings as he pours out his grace over and over throughout the order of service. However, there's just as much liturgy, if you understand it as the order of service and not something that the people do, in a service that thinks it has very little liturgy, like, like, a, like a modern contemporary worship service. When the word is proclaimed through song, through preaching, through reading, through the sacraments, and it creates faith in your heart that explodes toward God, the word of God is, is given through faith, for faith, for the individual to be in relationship with God in that moment. And so what, what do you bring to worship? You bring nothing but a repentant heart. What you receive is everything through the, through the word of God. Jesus shows up right where you are. And what ends up happening in worship is rest. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy, to really rest. And I don't mean sleep, although if you're in church and you fall asleep, <laughs> we'll wake you up when we're done because obviously this, the world has beaten you down this whole week long and you need a good, solid hour of sleep. But what I'm talking about is rest, to be still and know that I am God, Psalm 4610, to rest in God's presence and let him minister to you and care for you through the word, through, through music, through the power of the Holy Spirit, God has shown up in your midst. And we all need a good amount of rest, not sleep, but rest, to rest in God's presence. And if we're not getting it ourselves each day with just taking some time to be in the Word, to be in God's presence in private worship, that's what public worship is there to give you as well. Mm -hmm. It gives you an encounter with God where He promises to be in the Word preached and the sacraments administered for the forgiveness of sinners. And when that breaks in on you, the response comes out in you in prayer, praise, and thanksgiving. So if you think about the order of service that's going on, that's what's happening in, in both uh, our tradition service and our modern service. The pattern is pretty much the same. It's God preaches, the creature listens, and the creature then rests in God's presence and responds to God through prayer, through praise, through thanksgiving. And prayer can mean lament. It can mean pouring out, you know, forgive me a sinner. Mm -hmm. And God's word will come uh, in multiple ways over and over again. You are forgiven. You are forgiven. You are forgiven. This is what's called the absolution. And uh, some churches do a, a, a pattern of confession and absolution where, where we join together and we say, you know, we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. Uh, and then the preacher the, the, is designated by the people of God, the pastor, to exercise the office of the keys, which Jesus gives to his Christians. He says, whatever you forgive on earth is forgiven in heaven. Whatever you withhold on earth will be withheld in heaven, whatever you bind. In worship, the pastor is given that role to say the words, I forgive you of all of your sins in Jesus' name. It's not their own authority by which they're forgiving. They're only announcing the things that God has already judged. You are forgiven. And that word of forgiveness comes out in multiple ways in worship. If you go to church and you don't have that church handing Jesus over to you, it's not worship. Worship is not happening. Because worship is where you have the encounter with God through his word preached outside of you that creates faith in his son, in Jesus Christ. Questions, comments, concerns, queries? No, well, I, I do, I do, um, I wrote a couple questions down. So, um, the, uh, where two or three are gathered, so, so I will be there, or I, I probably have it messed up, but that's all right. What does that mean for the individual then? Um, 28 chapter, uh, chapter 28 verses 19 and 20 what does Jesus say he says um, 
It, this is what we call the Great Commission. Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything that I have taught you. And lo, remember, I am with you always, always to the end of the age. Um, the day you were baptized, the pastor placed his hand on your head when you were dunked in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And this promise was given. You are marked with the cross of Christ and sealed with the Holy Spirit now and forever. Where two or three are gathered, we have the promise that Jesus is present in the community, in the gathering, in the event. Through our baptismal promise, you have the assurance that God is with you always. So private worship is a one-on-one -on -one with God. Public worship is the people of God in relationship to God. And God is still engaging us one-on-one -on -one in that public setting. But the distinction is when we worship together, there is good order that follows the understanding that we're coming with repentant hearts before God. Private worship is constant because it's the relationship between you, the, the good creation, and your creator. There's no other thing that can engage you with God than worship. That's, that's, that's the relationship. It's incredibly intimate because God is your heavenly father, but he's still your God. Mm -hmm. And it brings another question about what worship is. Because if you show, you don't have to be a Christian to be worshiping something. You worship whatever is your ultimate concern. Yeah. You know, cuz um, it's what you rely on. Right. That that actually um, brings up something else we had talked about. We talked about last week and we talked about um, uh, earlier today and I want I want to hear both of your thoughts on this. It was uh, what Hulk Hogan said um, about I don't know, maybe a week or so ago. Um, but uh, I'll just read a little bit of it. I don't need to read the whole thing, but um, uh, Hulk Hogan says, God said, you are... Wait, wait, real quick. So maybe folks don't know who Hulk Hogan is. Is that is that a silly thing to say? Do people still know who the Hulkster... I know we do. We grew up with, you know... Well, okay, so Sarah was born in 1995, so she's our needle there. Um, Hulk Hogan is... He had a reality show, right? It, I felt super reckless, but also he had a great family reality TV show. <laughs> In the early 2000s. <laughs> yeah. Hulk, yes. <laughs> Hulk, Hulk, Hulk Hogan is, uh, yeah. Um, okay. He, this he's the Babe Ruth of. The, yeah. And, well, this is going down the ditch a little bit here, but uh, Hulk Hogan is what a lot of people think of when they think of pro wrestling. Yeah. But as far, he was a great entertainer, but as far as, as technical skills, well, he, he didn't have any. You, you, you and I are a bit more into this than the average Joe. A person <laughs> off the street might be like, you know, what, uh, Hulk Hogan was, he's, he's what a lot of people think wrestling is about. But as far as a wrestler's wrestler, there are many names I would put <laughs> above Hulk Hogan as like the greatest of all time. Yes. So, kind of like the LeBron James, uh, Michael Jordan argument, who, who really is the greatest. I think Hulk Hogan is often in that category with other people. He, he is, and, and there's no doubt that his charisma helped propel oh, yeah. wrestling in the 80s, for sure. Um, so Hulk Hogan said, uh, in three short months just like that, he, speaking of God, did with the plagues of Egypt, God has taken away everything we worship. God said, you want to worship athletes? I will shut down the stadium. You want to worship musicians? I will shut down civic centers. You want to worship actors? I will shut down theaters. You want to worship money? I will shut down the economy and collapse the stock market. You don't want to go to church and worship me? I will make it where you can't go to church. And then he, he said more of that. Um, but what are your thoughts on that? Um, uh, uh, what stands out probably to a lot of people is uh, you don't want to worship money. I'll shut down the economy and collapse the stock market. Mm -hmm. You know, and and that goes to what you were talking about earlier. If you can worship other things. Oh yeah. And we we have such a, a God shaped hole in every single person. We are constantly seeking something to worship. And if it's not the one true God, we will 
find something else that will be our ultimate concern. That, this is why the, the first commandment is, I am the Lord your God, you shall have no other gods. Because without God speaking that word that I am the Lord your God, we will immediately begin to look for something else to worship, mm -hmm. to rely on, and to which we will give prayer, praise, and thanksgiving. If it's not the one true God, it will be something else to our detriment. Um, whether it's money, power, fame, celebrity, um, even things that are really great, family, health, mm -hmm. you know, exercise, uh, a diet, social justice, whatever it is, whatever ideal we have made our ultimate concern is our God. Mm -hmm. um, and that God will demand from us what God's demand. The difference with the one true God is that the one true God pours himself out for the world. And the response is one of faithfulness, which is obedience to the word of God, that I am the Lord your God, you shall have no other gods. That's the obedience that we're talking about that happens in worship. If it's not to the one true God, if it's not to uh, the Lord, the good Lord, it will be to something else. And I think his statement is... is um, a powerful one. Now, it, it's always dangerous to speculate without a clear word from God as to what God's intentions are in the world. This world is, is a rough place. Mm -hmm. But God still calls it his good creation. It's the next part that he says that, that, crea that, that really hit home for me. If he would have just ended there and that was it, yeah. then it would have been like, okay, well, Hulk's a little cranky this morning. <laughs> so the, the next part he said... If my people who are called by who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forever their sin and and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. And then he went on to say, maybe we don't need a vaccine. Maybe we need to take this time of isolation from the distractions of the world and have a personal revival where we focus on the only thing in the world that really matters. Jesus. And so you have in a in a Twitter tweet, is that what they call them? Is that what kids call them these days? Uh, or a Facebook post, whatever it was. Uh, the Holy Spirit is making Hulk Hogan a preacher. And what does he do? After his kind of uh, speculative statement about the will of God, he goes to the word of God and announces it. And in that announcement, you have a promise from God that for the the person who has ears to hear, it creates faith. Mm -hmm. And it actually points you in the right direction of worship. And for Christians, all of Scripture, the Old Testament, the Psalms, which I believe he's quoting here, uh, or it's Isaiah. Actually, I'm not quite sure what he's quoting here. Does he? <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll look and see. If <laughs> it might be one of the prophets now that I think about it. At first I thought it was the Psalms. But um, he um, is proclaiming and pointing to where God wants to be known, which is in the Son, in Jesus Christ. And uh, for Christians, the Old Testament is the New Testament concealed, and the New Testament is the Old Testament revealed. All the promises in the Old Testament are fulfilled in the person of Jesus Christ. Um, and so when it comes to worship, God does not want to be known in his hiddenness. God gives us um, an ultimate concern by which we can properly worship him where he wants to be, and that is in Jesus Christ, in the Son. He is God revealed as compared to God being hidden from us. In such scary things where there is speculation as to what, what is God doing? You know, the, the big complaint that you can hear from people who lose their faith is there's so much suffering in the world. I don't know why these things are happening. Um, why does God allow this to happen? The fact of the matter is, and Martin Luther talked about this too, that when we're trying to seek into God's hidden will, which is really what the practice of magic is, uh, people who think that they're witches and wizards and whatever, they're trying to manipulate reality. They're trying to manipulate God to do what they want, to put God in a box. When we try to speculate into God's hidden will, as to why things happen a certain way, we're never going to find an answer that satisfies us. What we're going to run up against is 
um, the wrath of God. And Martin Luther said that when you're seeking God in his hiddenness, there is no difference in our eyes between God and the devil. Rather, the only place of comfort that we have, especially in trying times or times of suffering, is to go where God promises to be, where he has revealed himself in such a way that he is a God that you can love and who loves you, it's Jesus Christ. And so even the hiddenness of God drives us to Jesus, where we can properly worship him. Does that make sense? It does. Um, and, and Second Chronicles. Oh, I was way off. <laughs> ch chapter 7, verse 14. Second Chronicles, uh, chapter 7, verse 14 says, If my people who are called by my name humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their life. See, I should have used my lifeline to Pastor Cross because he is, <laughs> he is our biblical scholar uh, as high as they come, and he would have known immediately yeah, what it was. He, so. Yeah, he could have told us right where to, right where to turn. <laughs> yep. But luckily we had Bible Gateway for this one. Oh, so. good. Well, <laughs> if, if you can't get a hold of Pastor, <laughs> Pastor Paul, go to Google. Yes. Yep, go to the Google. Yeah. So... Uh, so that is that is uh, uh, interesting, and it's interesting coming from a guy like Hulk Hogan. Oh, I know. I, know? I, I, I love that. You know, growing up uh, watching Hulk Hogan and, you know, um, with his, uh, what did he used to say? Uh, eat your vitamins, say your prayers. and Say your prayers, uh, train, say your prayers, and eat your vitamins. Yeah, and yeah. Time, yeah. And I think for many of us who grew up in that age, it was like he was – Larger than life, you know, oh, especially if, sure. you, if you're a wrestling fan. For sure. Um, and so, you know, at this point in his life and, you know, the reality TV show and everything else, <laughs> you know, he's a big he's a big public figure. And it's it, you should never judge public figures by what you see on TV because it's all. You're only seeing whatever um, is being put out there, and it's usually a very one dimensional perspective. Yeah. But to hear him from his own words, you know, give this confession of, of faith is just. It's heartening. Yeah, and, and you know we all live 24 hours a day, mm -hmm. and we see these people on TV, especially the reality show. Oh, yeah. What is that? Was it a half hour, or was it yeah, an hour? Half hour, hour. To an hour. Yeah. yeah, and that was for a whole week, mm -hmm. you yeah, know, or, or whatever it was. Right. So. Well, and I think it's also interesting and nice to hear that from him because you know you think of kind of the grumblings right now of like all these celebrities where it's like we're all going through hard times. It's like you have a 30 bedroom mansion, <laughs> but this is somebody who. Yeah. In an earthly sense, who also is finding yeah. yeah. He also has it all and gets to share that. And you know what? The thing about it is, is rich or poor, um, male, female, wh whatever the distinctions are that the world places on us before the one true God, we are all the same. Mm -hmm. uh, we're all the same. We are all sinners in need of forgiveness in need of a savior mm -hmm. and when that hits home that we're all the same right. no one is better no one is worse uh, regardless of, of the worldly circumstances uh, suddenly you begin to see your neighbor not as someone to be jealous of or to pity but that the Lord has called you to love your brother to love your sister yeah. um, that's worship lived out you know we come to church to rest in God's presence, to, re to receive a word so that we would be empowered to live our faith day to day. And living your faith day to day is worshiping God. Yeah, right. I forgot what I was going to say. <laughs> I do have another question written down, though. Um, another thing that, that you said in this, this um, I only mention it because I had heard it uh, a couple of weeks ago in a movie, and you'll know what I'm talking about, DJ, when, when, uh, when I say it. Uh, whatever you hold true on earth, I will hold true in heaven. You, you talked about that a little bit ago, and um, the movie Dogma sort of went into that a little bit. Um, what does that mean exactly? Whatever you hold true on earth, I will hold true in heaven. Whatever um, you... It's the, it's the office of the keys that Jesus um, gives this promise uh, at the end of chapter 
uh, of John chapter 20, and, I, and it's, it's in the other Gospels too, but Jesus says, receive the Holy Spirit, mm-hmm. and so his disciples receive the Holy Spirit, and in receiving the Holy Spirit, they now have eyes to see who Jesus is, what he has done, what he is doing, and are then commissioned into um, ministry, which is to be witnesses. That, that word that we use, um, the word martyr, mm-hmm. well, it, it just means witness, martyrios. Um, we are witnesses of what God has done for us as Christians. And Jesus then gives to his disciples what's called the office of the keys or to the apostles. And it goes like this. Whatever you forgive on earth will be forgiven in heaven. So whatever is announced by the preacher that your sins are forgiven in a public setting, those aren't that person's words. These are the words of God. Okay. Okay, this is what we mean by the office of the keys. And the pastor is not in a higher role than everyone else. When he announces it, he's announcing it for the forgiveness of his own sins too. Um, But he's put in this position with particular responsibilities. And that responsibility is to absolve in the name of Christ, to absolve all who have ears to hear the forgiveness of their sins. So the, the office of the keys is whatever you forgive on earth will be forgiven in heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And the way this works is if you refuse to hear that your sins are forgiven, well, then your, your sin is bound because you don't believe the promise. You don't believe Jesus. That's, that's kind of the point that's being made here. Mm-hmm. Uh, in the movie Dogma, it's, it's, it's following more of a, of a Catholic doctrine of the authority of the forgiveness of sins that comes through the church and can be designated by the different statuses of the priest, whether it's a, a bishop or a cardinal or the pope, mm-hmm. through um, something called an indulgence. And an indulgence is, is like an official statement of the forgiveness of sins to the person who receives it. And I think in that movie, there was like a one-time get out of jail sure, free card sure. if you pass through the arches. You're right. Yeah, right? Yeah. And yeah. That, that it was um, designated, I don't know if it was designated by the bishop of that church or by the pope or whatever, um, but that's not what we mean when we talk about the office of the keys. What we're talking about is the authority to forgive sinners. Yeah. And Christians have this in their own life too. Um, it's not just pastors that have it. In, in the public worship setting, the responsibility, not the, not the power and not the rank, but the responsibility of the preacher is to announce the things of God so that God comes in our midst because all we come bringing is repentant hearts. Mm-hmm. And God sends the preacher to give the response to that repentant heart, which is, I forgive you of your sins. When you're at home with your spouse, or with your friends, or with your family, or whoever it may be, and and someone has hurt you, right, personally, when they say they're sorry, and you say, I forgive you, as a Christian, that has not just temporal consequences, it has eternal consequences. Because the sin that was caused to you is not only a sin against you, it's a sin against God. And by announcing that forgiveness, you are absolving them of any guilt that would be held against them by God because God says in Scripture, vengeance is mine, says the Lord, and I will repay. Um, that's the scary part. That's God and his hiddenness. But it's, it's judgment on evil. And so the Christian is authorized by Jesus to forgive sinners. Um, It also includes withholding forgiveness for the person who refuses to be forgiven. Mm. It's not you saying, curse you. It's just saying, this person has plugged their own ears from hearing the promise of Jesus. And so it stands not as forgiveness, but as judgment on the person. We talked a little bit about this with the sacrament. If you're eating the sacrament, and you don't want the Lord's Supper um, because you don't believe that your sins will be forgiven in eating and drinking, then don't take it. Right. Because you're taking it to your condemnation, not to your salvation. Right. 
Well, the ministry of the church is given to the apostles and it has been passed down through the generations to all Christians. All Christians are the priesthood of all believers. The pastor is not higher than anyone else. The pastor is given a specific ministry and role that doesn't have a higher rank and privileges. It has specific responsibilities in order to make sure that the ministry of word and sacrament is carried out because it's through these means of grace that God chooses to break in on the world and turn sinners into saints through faith in Jesus Christ alone. Yeah, you bet. that down. Yeah. So, Sarah, did you have any, any questions or anything that, that comes to mind? Uh, this is my carryover question from last week with you talking about, I finally remembered it, um, talking about communion and you shouldn't take it unless it's mutually agreed. So how does that work then in the Catholic side of things? Because that is, like, you only take it if you are, you know, born Catholic. Yep. Is that more along the lines of in their realm of things or you only believe if you believe in the Yes. Catholic well and branch of it? so there are churches that practice something um, that that gets referred to as as close or closed communion. Mm -hmm. um, and what what that is meant to do is to protect against an unworthy receiving of the sacrament. And um, for for Roman Catholics, for some Lutherans, for, for other church denominations, there is an expectation of confession and forgiveness prior to receiving the sacrament so that you're not receiving it to your condemnation. Um, and that has more to do with church tradition mm -hmm. than it does from any specific command from Jesus in Scripture. Um, the, the command to repent and be forgiven is, is tied not only to the sacrament, but to the daily life of the Christian. And so the sacrament becomes a means by which God promises to show up in your midst to guarantee you that, yes, indeed, you, the sinner, are forgiven of all of your sins. How do I know it? I ate the bread. I drank the wine. It is his body. It is his blood. And so when the devil's throwing uh, your sins in your face, you can tell him to go to hell. You ate the bread. Jesus commanded it. You drank the wine. It promises the forgiveness of sins. It is his body and blood. Um, and so for us, we don't make a distinction between whether or not you are worthy in any other regard than between you and God. Do you believe that this promise is for you? If you don't believe that, then you shouldn't take uh, of, of the bread and the wine. But if you are a baptized Christian who believes in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, and you want to receive him again this day, come and receive. Um, our more Protestant brothers and sisters um, don't, uh, don't see the Lord's Supper as a sacrament. They see it as an ordinance, that God's grace is not being handed over to them. What's often lifted up in Baptist circles or, um, or you know, the modern American evangelical circles is the idea of a personal relationship with Jesus Christ or the altar call. Um, what we do as Lutherans is every time we have communion, it's an altar call. So it's not just that I accepted Jesus Christ April 1st, 1978. I receive Jesus Christ whenever he shows up in our midst every single Sunday because I need to have my faith. I can't live on yesterday's faith. I need to have my faith renewed every single day. Mm -hmm. So God comes to us through means of grace so that we would have a big fat faith, right? Uh, a word preached, baptism, repentance, um, the sacrament, the office of the keys, um, the, the mutual comfort and co consolation among Christians where that, where that key is exercised unofficially and in public worship where it is exercised officially through confession and absolution. All of these are means by which God assures you, the sinner, that you're a keeper, that your sins are forgiven, that new life has begun now and continues for eternity. Um, and we never move beyond that. I mean, uh, we grow deeper in our faith, but growing deeper in your faith really means that from the moment Jesus tackles you, you spend the rest of your life getting used to the fact that you have a Savior. Mm -hmm. 
and you quit trying to worship other things and your worship is focused only to God where he promises to be in Jesus Christ. Yeah. And you worship every day. And you worship every day. All day. Yeah. You don't eat once a week. Well, it's like, you know, when I think about faith, it's like, well, I, I believed once upon a time. It's, it's kind of like, well, that's like me saying that I breathed last week. <laughs> yeah. Don't want to wear it out, so I'm yeah. not going <laughs> to exercise it. Um, no, you, you breathe every day, and, yeah. and faith is the same thing. Some, sometimes uh, repentance and faith and worship of God, they're, they're, they're synonymous. They roll together. Um, you can't worship without being, having a repented heart. You can't have faith um, without having repentance at the same time. Yeah. And you can't worship without those things because worship is the outflowing uh, and response to God's amazing grace that comes to you. So you can't, it's difficult to systematize these things. Right. They all happen spontaneously in you when that word of God breaks in upon you. Yeah. Excellent. Well, speaking of worship, uh, for anybody listening, uh, if you want to join us here at Atonement, um, you can find us on atonement.live, atonement.org, uh, YouTube, Vimeo, right? Um, 9 a.m. and 10.30 a.m. every Sunday. Uh, and are we doing 7 o'clock as well? Um, I don't know. This, yet. I think this next Sunday we are. Yeah. This next Sunday, 7 p.m. at atonement.live and .org. Okay, yeah. atonement.live and .org. Um, you, can, you can find the links there. And at those times, um, at, uh, there will be uh, chat hosts available um, who you can uh, chat with uh, about prayer. Uh, if you have a particular prayer, uh, you can come on there. Um, and if you can't join at those particular times, the services will be shown all week long. Uh, so that's a good time to come on and, and worship with us and check everything out. Sometimes there's shenanigans and tomfoolery on, on uh, the, the different children's messages that we have. Um, ever faithful, though. <laughs> ever faithful. Yes, ever faithful. Um, and I, I believe Paul will be preaching this week. Yep, um, Pastor Cross. Yep, Pastor Cross will be preaching this week, and, and it's going to be great again. Uh, so, so please join us, 9.30, or 9 o'clock and 10.30 Sunday. Um, and I think... Uh, I think I've exhausted my, um, hey, why don't you pray this week for each of you over the last couple of weeks. You know, I thought about this because I've been watching a lot of community in my my time at home working from home. Either of you guys watch community? I've heard of it. No. Super good show. You should watch <laughs> it. But there's a whole thing where there's one of the guys that it's Joel McHale's character. He always is like, oh, there's seven of us. It's a six-sided dice. We're going to roll to see who has to go down and get the pizza. So you all get to go into the roll and count people off. But this is your... <laughs> there's, oh. two people, there's seven people with six sided dice. <laughs> yeah, a, a friend of mine, a friend of mine once said um, he was somewhere uh, where everybody was going to pray, and and uh, somebody was called on to pray, and they were too scared, and he said to them, "You're just talking to Jesus, man. Yeah, you're just talking to Jesus. Yeah. So, all right. Well, we will close with a prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for this time. Uh, thank you for Pastor DJ. Thank you for Sarah, um, and thank you for this conversation where we can learn more about our private and our public worship. And Lord, I pray for everyone listening to this uh, uh, podcast episode today that they would be blessed by what they heard um, and will have learned from it and will grow deeper in their faith and worship every day, all day. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.